everyone and welcome to my channel Knitted Art History where I'm sitting telling you some art history stories while knitting and well, welcome or welcome back and uh, well today as you can already see by the name of the video we'll be talking about an interesting topic uh, a topic that I am myself uh, not familiar like at all <laughs> so yeah so I decided so I was talking in a previous video that I decided to stay on this side, I decided that I want to learn something also, something new, and not just you know, retelling already what I know. Uh, so we, yeah, and today we are gonna be. So, as you can see, we, today we're gonna be talking about Iranian art. As I was mentioning already a few times, that I am more familiar with uh, architecture of uh, Iran, uh, of ancient architecture uh, specifically. And I think actually that I will make a video also about that because it's a very, well, it's a topic that uh, deserves to be mentioned and the architecture was so mind-blowing. I remember we were studying and I was like, I still remember a few of these palaces <laughs> that I was really, you know, I was imagining how they looked like when they were like in the full bloom and I mean, how people were blown away about this grandeur and about this beauty that was there so yes yeah, so i think we will be talking about this and uh, part of this so i wanted to make a video just overall about the court of arts of iran but well i started to read and um, i mean obviously it's a very vast theme the history of art of iran it's an enormously vast theme uh, with a lot of new things that needs to be discovered to studies and stuff like that uh, so I decided that, well, I will divide actually on videos because I think that this video will be quite long. Uh, and today we will be talking specifically about ceramics, uh, which includes not just vessels, but also tiles. And uh, because you see the theme, the, it, is a, it is a vast theme. I will leave you in a description. Uh, I will leave you one video. Uh, it was like a presentation of a book about uh, Iranian ceramics and well the author made you know a brief like uh, a brief history brief presentation of what he was talking and what about when th there's a lot of interesting things there that if you if you will be you know if you'll be interested in the theme and I will leave you also books down below there'll be a few books uh, that uh, well I myself I haven't read them, but I, you know, I was picking up some stuff from, from them and uh, uh, yeah, so if you, again, if you're interested, I think it will be a very good books to read and to well, educate yourself more on this topic. So uh, make sure to check the description to this video. And uh, yeah, so as I said, today we're going to be talking about ceramics, but uh, the theme of the court of arts is huge and, you know, the theme of uh, fabrics is another huge theme, the theme of um, carpets, it's another enormously huge theme, so I decided I will divide, so you know, it will be maybe actually a series about Iranian decorative art, so, because I didn't even, you know, I didn't even actually get into jewelry and all of this stuff, so it's also a theme that I really, because um, Middle Eastern jewelry is, yeah, like, it's on another level, I, I am so, so fascinated about this and, well, today is a very, very gloomy day here in Ukraine because, you know, the temperature is, like, uh, going like that and, uh, yeah, so, so you know, so one day we can have plus six, so the next day we have minus eight and so, yeah, so we have a misty morning, misty day, so I decided that we need to talk about something colorful, something beautiful, something, like, interesting uh to well distract ourselves and stuff and plus uh let's not forget about things that was going on in in the world and uh the only thing you know that i will tell because if i will get into that i will get very heated and a lot of you will not like what i was what i will be telling um but you know the fact that a lot of you on the west forget that there is you know you have a spam of attention of a golden fish it's actually pretty disturbing and uh, you know there is place for everyone to talk about everyone without bragging that those deserve this those not and i you know don't forget about us here in ukraine and let's not forget about all of this awful thing that's going on in iran still going on in iran and 
yeah so i want to also you know bring some attention to this topic and uh, it's also really really mind-blowing it's also a very good example for a lot of people a lot of other oppressed nations that you actually can do everything what you want if you will understand how valuable you are and how much power you people have as a whole if you really unite and for a lot of westerners it's not understandable that oh but you know you are like pacifist and all of this stuff pacifism is shit i'm sorry like a psa and there is certain situations where um you cannot deal with them with pacifism because those who are you dealing with do not understand talking they just understand force and a very brutal gruesome and cruel force so unfortunately this is how you are fighting for your freedom and we fought like this in 2013 why the war started in 2014 uh here in ukraine and i hope that also that you iranians also will you know push it and no matter of what of this cruel and gruesome uh yes let's start to cry <laughs> let's start the video with crying but well i will stop here and just you know keep fighting keep pushing and eventually you know unfortunately this is how all of the freedom is coming from with blood and with loses but we will remember those people right we will talk about them we will still you know talk about their legacy and live our life for them so they you know they didn't die for nothing so yeah so let's not forget about that and continue going on so the other thing also that i want to add that if this video somehow will get to iranians and especially those who are familiar with ceramics or they know or maybe you are yourself a cer ceramist um it would be very nice you know if you will you know if i will say some kind of nonsense you will um educate us uh that i said that nonsense because obviously you know i took everything just from books because i never was there i don't know anything about this i mean i was just reading the well specialized literature so i hope that those people those these books that i was reading it was not something you know uh those people who are studying iran for decades already they are not writing some nonsense but still or maybe you have some kind of personal stories and maybe you know something uh, maybe you still have some kind of traditions in your own family it would be actually very nice and i mean feel free uh if you want to obviously to share it with was with me personally with everyone else so yeah i'm sorry for such maybe a long intro but i felt that i need to say that so yeah so let's dive in straight out into our topic so today i will finally knit i have my knitting today with me and uh, yeah so let's dive into our topic today so iranian art overall occupies a very very important place in the history of art of, of east just overall what is here that um, incredible architectural complexes were created over thousands of years and all possible types of arts were um developing so before diving into our topic i I, I think that it would be appropriate actually to talk about historical thing because the periodization, you know, the history of Iran is also there's a lot of things was going on, but I will tell you just very, very briefly what like what things were happening there. Uh, because it's important it's important for art because every time you know, when the country is being conquered by something, obviously they're being influenced by their conqueror. But Iran is a bit you know, it's a pretty unique place as we can say. So I will start with uh, the Achaemenid Empire. It was the middle of 6th till 4th um, centuries BC and it occupied actually a very huge territory from Egypt to India. So um, obviously we can see very, like we can see a lot of different influ influences uh, and artistic features. After that, the um, Alex Alexander Macedonian, how do you call it? Macedonian, right? Uh, conquered the territory and this was the first time when the trade with west started 
and uh, we can also see that you know that Iranian and Hellenistic cultures they started to somehow emerge you know influence each other and uh, etc in the year 224 so it is BC the Sassanid or or in English it's Sasanian but so I mean as I saw it's you can say both ways Sassanids or Sasanians uh, so this dynasty began to uh, to unite territories again at the peak of its power the empire occupied territory of the Mesopotamia of uh, partly of Transcaucasia and Central Asia uh, it was for a little like brief period of time it was also Syria it was Palestine it was modern Turkey and uh, also Egypt a unique and rich artistic culture was created during this period of time and we would see that uh, actually the, the period the, the, the art of this period influenced um, the development of art of every other centuries after that. Because in this period of time, also, uh, what, what is interesting, uh, many conquered uh, people, I mean, they were conquered by Sassanids, they, well, took a very active part in, my God, they were, took a very um, active part in developing uh, Iranian art. And at the end of the day, you know, when, when uh, this art, this Iranian art, new art, uh, itself influenced the culture of neighboring countries and on the first place, place it was um, the Byzantine Empire. Then in 7th century, the country of the Sassanids uh, uh, was conquered by Arabs that brought here Islam. Nevertheless, despite the fact that by the 9th century Islam it was like one of well one of the most um, popular religion and like the, the majority of people were um, were already converted into Islam. Arabs could not break their established traditions but only influence them. A new type of buildings appear. Uh, this is one of the most important things of the mosques appeared in this period of time. Uh, fine art, especially sculptures, was banned. Uh, well, because I think a lot of you know that uh, like Islam is not allowing to show uh, like human figures, you know, like godlike figures, stuff like this. So like very, very briefly, if not getting too deeply into this topic. So uh, yeah, so no, no human figures. Uh, but we will see that Iran was not, you know, again, I'll tell you about that. Uh, and also, 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 uh, uh, because you see, they were not allowed, like sculpture was not allowed, you know, stuff like this, like uh, with uh, human figures was not allowed. The court of art started to flourish even more, especially, you know, with this uh, very like whimsical ornaments and stuff like that. At the beginning of 10th century, part of the Eastern land uh, went to the Central Asian country um, of the Samanids, so the Samanid uh, Empire, Samanid dynasty was there, and the culture for Iran uh, mutu mutually, I'm sorry, influenced the culture of um, Central Asia. The 10th and 13th century was pretty important period of time uh, of Iranian art, because in this period of time, in this um, uh, well, in in this period, yeah, the main form of constructions were the main for type of buildings were um, were established. The main types and styles of art were established. Uh, so yes, and and then they were just you know like develop and develop and develop. And. However, in the first part of 13th century, the Mongolians uh, got there. Uh, the Mongolians' um, invasion started, which brought the devastation and, um, well, delayed a bit the development of Iranian art and Iranian culture. This um, delay in development was just for a brief period of time, because in the, um, in the second half of the 13th century, the economy and culture began to rise again, as well as various types of art. And we can say that, well, Mongolian obviously you know, the conquerors, they will uh, influence somehow the art, and we can say that uh, the Mongolian influence is seen in such things. So, for example, in the paintings of ceramics, we can see the images of dragons. Uh, in fabrics, they started to make those fabrics not so colorful, and uh, so now it was more about dark colors in combination with metallic threads, for example, so silver or gold, etc. In the 13th, 15th centuries, um, so 
they were difficult because you know it was the period of time with, of constant wars with like ever since ever so I said, as I said Mongolians, the Seljuks, uh, also some um, tribes from uh, like Afghan tribes also was constantly going on there and etc etc but despite this difficult time the Iranian people did not forget you know their traditions and try to maintain their uh, originality of their ancient cultures plus we can see that it is it you know they were very successful in this because the period of time from um what from 12 till uh well someone says 11 but i, I saw more the 12 to 14th period 14th century so it's like middle ages uh, it, it is considered to be the highest you know rise in the ceramics for example works of decoratives and uh, of decorative arts were performing performed in the highest level uh, various type of decorate, decorative arts were strongly influenced by miniature also in this period of time because sketches for like fabrics, for example, or carpets were very often made by uh, illuminators. In the 16th and 17th century, uh, Iran was united under the rule of the Safavids and uh, experienced a significant rise in national culture. In this period, weaving and uh, carpet, carpet making were particularly developed. And many works of this period of time, they have very, you know, this bright, um, like, court, um, court ca character, how to call it, right? So, you know, it was mostly everything was made for, for the co court, not you know, for religion or something like that. The Safavid era, especially during the reign of Shah Abbas I, uh, was a period of time, it was a period of re-establishing uh, of ties with Western Europe. At the end of the 17th century, a certain European influence also started to be felt on art. Like, for example, uh, it was, you know, uh, we can see this in the choice of subject uh, that artists were, were, were choosing, but later in uh, also in imitating the manner of um, like imitating the manner, imitating some technical stuff also from like technical aspect from European uh, masters. Wars and uh, interpersonal conflicts in the 18th century and early 19th century had a very negative impact on the development of some types of decorative arts. However, whatever possible, uh, you know, Iranian craftsmen they still maintain their originality and uh, high level of performance of their art. So now let's dive into ceramics directly. The first samples of ceramics on the territory of Iran is dated back to 8 millennia uh, BC, millennium, 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 yeah, right, BC. Uh, and uh, well, ceramics occupied a special place in the culture of Iran because a ceramic product could be, uh, could be both a sacred object and a utilitarian thing. Uh, ceramics were used absolutely everywhere, uh, like in private life, in mosques, in palaces, and etc. etc. And as I said, it's not just vessels, you know, it's not just vases, amphoras, or stuff like this. It's also tiles, it's also considered to, like, it's also in this category, and we'll be talking about this for like a bit. The evolution of view of the world of world structure was reflected in the symbolism depicted on the uh, on the ceramics. The traditions of its use are related to ideas about the forces of good and evil of uh, uh, like about spirits interacting with the world of people. It was a single organism or parts of which are interconnected from uh, or from preparation to usage of the, of, of this uh, item the canon formed by the experience of many gener generations and influences on Iranian cultures were necessary for the creativity of traditional masters and helped Iranian potters to create stable examples and uh, of stable examples of the shape and paintings uh, painting of vessels these constant changes in world world view, you know, beliefs and traditions uh, that took place over many centuries, led from uh, Neolithic abstract symbols that were depicted back then in on this um, uh, on the ceramics products um, and ancient vessels to a complex uh, system of aesthetic views transmitted in the most refined in form and most complex in the core Safavid uh, ceramics. And as already said, that we would see that um, 
in a few centuries the masters would actually be inspired by like especially by Safavids so uh, ceramic by uh, by ceramics of this period of time this long and comp and complex uh, process of compiling aesthetics and philosophical ideas about the world which took place in different ways among different people has its own characteristic in Iran as well. And we can say that the most amazing like thing about Iranian art, about Iranian culture, is the ability to absorb, accept the traditions of, of their conquerors, uh, but not just, you know, blindly uh, and just like being, you know, accepting all of this, but they were taking this and they were completely redoing this. Well, not completely, but they were like redoing this. They were putting it through the prism of their own culture and they had this ability to preserve its, uh, you know, their bright national individuality. So in the, you know, there were no accidents in the ceramic products. Nothing was secondary there. There were no function here that would be reduced only to decoration. Each vessel had a precisely fixed shape and was intended to be used in a certain way. I read, for example, uh, one of the women, one of the books that was uh, taken. So, it, so she was telling, she was writing that uh, she uh, visited Iran, actually, and uh, uh, she told that uh, she, I don't remember why, like she was in somewhere's house and she asked for, um, you know, for a drink, to drink water, and the woman gave her a uh, drink in a, in a mug, certain mug, so she she drank a bit and then she she said that I wanted to pour some water on my hands to you know to clean myself and clean my hands and the woman was you know the reaction of the light you know she like grabbed this vessel and she said like no 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 it's just for drinking and she gave me completely another vessel where she you know poured the like took the water and she poured it into my hands so uh, you see so. so that's what I'm saying. So if this video will get to Iranians, <laughs> uh, so tell me whether it's true and whether it's you know it's a very popular practice like this, and you whether you still have this type of things that you know that you still respect all of the vessels and you still have all of them. You know, all of them have their own functions, and you can and there cannot be mixed. Each thing seems to be endowed with its own soul and destiny, and could be uh, and could not be simply thrown away. And uh, also a little bit similar, we also have this thing in Ukrainian culture that in, in like uh, older generation that, you know, this animalistic point of view. Well, I mean, it's a lot of a lot of uh, different uh, nations in the world that also our ancestors were uh, given souls, you know, everything has soul, you know, every object has its soul and stuff like that. Um, Forms and signs on ceramic products were also given a, a separate meaning. So, for example, uh, you know, you so for example, there were some kind of like symbols or things that were uh, meant to protect the food in these vessels. Uh, others uh, example also is that uh, you know other symbols that were as a wish for will be into the person that was using this vessel sometimes uh, dishes were used also as a talismans and uh, they were well pretty often the um, tell me i'll tell you the plates were hung uh, you know on the wall uh, opposite up opposite yeah of the entrance of the house interesting stuff also that initially when all of this started that was exclusively a women's job so because uh, the main idea behind that was that, well, women, like woman is given birth to a child, to a new life. And it was believed that uh, she was given life to a thing also, because as I said, they believed that all of this object had had the, their own souls. So then with the appearance of uh, Potter's wheel, this, um, this work was transferred to men obviously <laughs> and uh, it was starting from like this period of time that the, the whole workshop started to to be created but in both cases it was not easy to become a you know a pottery master so it was not like you know just a random person could become a pottery master uh, so it was uh, you know you needed to go through the 
certain initiation and it was mostly in a, well, in a period of time where it was a woman's job it was going from like mother to daughter and etc when it became a uh, man's job it from father to son so it was you know the whole dynasty of potterers and it was very very rarely that someone you know from a complete complete stranger was able to get into this business and was able to uh, became a potterer but you i i didn't find a you know the whole process like the description of what what they needed to go through uh but um but it was written you know that this ritual was so significant that it was actually practiced till the uh like until the 20th century there so and i read that now it is well it is a bit easier easier to became a potter but it's still not so easy and it is still a pretty um expensive thing to become a potter and well mostly it's still these dynasties that are you know going from like ancient period of time like old period of times uh so yeah so again if you know this if it's nonsense write down that it's nonsense it's not the, then confirm that it's not nonsense uh, but i just found you no know, it's very interesting other interesting thing that i found is the process actually of creation of the of the pottery so it was divided into three phases so the first one it was the preparation and the findings of all of the materials of clay and glazes so in the period of time when women uh or like it was just a, a women's job uh, only a senior craftswoman, uh, she had the right to look to bring these raw materials. It is interesting that a craftswoman uh, that you know had someone deceased in her house, uh, she was not allowed to do the pottery, and in more even that her siblings they were not allowed to uh, order pottery from somewhere else. So I guess it's, you know, just for some period of time when these rituals were going on, because I, I'm not really familiar with, uh, well, Iranian rituals, <laughs> like death rituals, but I, I guess it's, you know, for this brief period of time where, where yeah, things was going on. It's not forever, but, uh, well, just interesting thing. Second part, the second phase is making an item. So when ceramics was a woman's business, um as i mentioned there were no such things as workshops so they were either working on a free air as we can say on open air or they are working directly in a house of uh, well those who customized her this pottery uh workshops appeared with the potter's wheel as i said uh and the transition of the industry to men a furnace started to be installed in workshops obviously why furnace? Furnace, I'm sorry. I, I'm always, I don't know why, but I always want to say furnace. Furnace was installed in the workshops. And uh, yeah, so e here also the situation was like that. So uh, it was not, you know, that people were randomly like, oh, here, there will be our workshop. No, they still needed to make some rituals. They still needed to summon this uh, spirits that were... Uh, the craft spirits you know that were uh you know these holy forces and then these holy forces would tell them oh you need to build it here and they like they will start the buildings and they would um place uh, their worship there and this worship they were almost like you know i will allow myself such an, an analogy they were almost like uh, churches because they this was considered to be like you know a clean place uh, and thus, um, that's why the whole worship needed to be well kept and clean. Obviously, the uh, furnace and uh, pottery wheel, pottery's wheel, uh, occupied a central place. And masters never sit down to work without performing a ritual of purification. In the evening, from uh, Thursday to Friday, also interesting thing, lamps were um, were placed on the furnace and on the spotter's wheel and it was you know like um it represented this sacrifice uh to the patrons of the crafts uh when the new workshop was open also um the owner like new owner he was um 
like he arranged a sacrifice sacrificial feast uh to which he invited more like senior masters and all, all other masters a ram or a goat was uh, slaughtered near the furnace and then um its blood was sprinkled all over across the furnace and the pottery's wheel and also interesting that one master had you know um several I mean, not successful items made one by one, like one after another uh, they were also performed these rituals and they were sacrificed some of the animals, uh, some food uh, for the spirits because it was considered that, oh, we, you know, we made something. Uh, so now this, um, oh my god, I want to see ghosts. <laughs> well, ghosts of ancestors, you know, holy spirits, they were mad at us and uh, we needed to make something for them to be... Uh, you know, to love us again, as we can say it like that. The third, uh, the third phase was the firing or burning. To be honest, I don't know what what word to use here because well, so both of them use. When women worked on pottery, uh, it was uh, well this this thing it was seasonal, and the place of uh, firing well varied, but it was never. Um, never near the residential buildings. Only the ritually clean women and boys under the age of seven years old were allowed to do this process. The senior craftswomen started the entire firing process with a prayer. The two, uh, little twigs from crossroads were also um, was necessarily placed inside uh, to scare scare away all of these evil spirits sometimes they were even put in some of dog excrements because it was believed that dog is a protector of the house from uh, of the house of the owner from uh, bad spirits when the uh, fire in the ritual food uh, for the spirits were placed near the fern furnace and after uh, the process ended, the artisans uh, like were eating this food before firing they made special dolls that uh, symbolize these patterns, uh, pattern spirits, and they were situated near the place of burning. The, you know, the woman would sit near them, and they were like, you know, they were like feeding these dolls. They were listening to them. They were talking to them, just like as if they were the real human beings. And the dolls remained uh, in, in their place um, until the end of the whole process. Then they were collected and put in a um, well, clean again place in the house uh, but um, interesting stuff that for every firing every burning there were uh, uh, another set of dolls made and so when um, this uh, women this uh, masters they had well you know they started to have like way too much of dolls that they can um take in, in the house there was like more no place for them they would take take some of these dolls and they would uh, bury them uh, somewhere like in, in the in a cemetery uh, when things got to men uh, well as far as i understood obviously things those type of rituals were not made so they were not making dolls something like that but they were kind of similar rituals uh, with their own obviously uh, influence but uh, yeah but it was well it was something like that also and you see considering that ceramics can be considered not only as a part of the artistic heritage but also a spiritual one it is not surprised that it has received the greatest spread and development among all um, all of the other types of decorative arts in Iran it is ceramics that are an invaluable source of knowledge about the art of the uh, oldest inhabitants of Iran. And now let's talk about another very interesting stuff which is like uh, very popular in Iran and uh, you know it, it uh, took a very big place in Iranian art. So uh, at the 7th and 10th centuries uh, those um, uh, those centuries are characterized by cobalt drawings on a white background. Mainly it was plant motifs, sometimes um, there were images of people and uh, animals. And you can see this is what I was mentioning, that even though the Islam started to settle in this territory, still Iranian masters, they were, you know, 
finding their ways of uh, well doing what they were doing prior to that for not just centuries but millennia already uh, so yes yeah, so we would still see some of this um, some of the examples of human figures some of the uh, yes some of the human figures in uh, in subjects of uh, ceramics of the spirit of time and after that uh, at the end of the 9th century, a lusterware appeared. So lusterware is a pretty unique thing. And as I understood by reading this, you know, it is mostly now associated with Iran, even though it is, there's still a lot of debate where this uh, technique comes from, but we will talk about this in, in, in a second. Uh, what is a uh, lusterware? So it is a very thin, transparent pellicle that was applied on top of the glaze. After refiring at a low temperatures, uh, it gave a uh, you know this like iridescent effect, um, like metallic effect sometimes, um, which um, you know this like metallic sheen uh, depended on which metals were included in the lusterware paint. So the lusterware was made um, by mixing different combinations of sulfur with oxides of silver or copper, high resistant clay, and a small amount of uh, acid. Not not acid. Small amount of acid. Yes. Yeah, so it uh, uh, could be the uh, uh, tell me the the vinegar or uh, wine tinctures. It was uh, added so that mixture would, uh, would better combine with the glaze. Unfortunately, the luster pellicle can be easily destroyed if uh, you know the whole pottery gets into acidic soil. Then the luster wear turns pale, uh, or it can actually even crumble apart. And the technique of uh, of this uh, luster wear was kept in secret for well. Um, many many years, centuries, by a small number of uh, potters of uh, dynasties of potters. So uh, it is a bit. You see, uh, I think we can make parallels with uh, Murano glass. That also that was mostly dynasties of glass workers, and they were like um, sharing the secrets of this work just with their sons, uh, and their son with their sons, and stuff like this. And you could be actually severely punished if you would uh sell it you know tell someone this this um, the secret of murano glass so it was completely the same thing here however you see the origin of this uh technique is uh, a subject of debates among scholars because some believe that it is um this thing was originated from mesopotamia Another believes that is it came actually from Egypt, while other believe that this is um, technique that appeared directly in Iran itself. However, there is one fact that we know for sure that from the period of uh, in uh, no how to say in the pottery of the period of seventh and eighth centuries of prior to that, because we're talking about nines, uh, the Coptic uh, masters Copts, it's the Christians, um, the Egyptian who. Christian Egyptians, how to call it, right? <laughs> but it, yeah, uh, so they had the examples of um, of, of ceramics with uh, lusterware. Uh, the formation of glazing in, in ceramics and its active development are believed to be connected with the prohibition of Islam to use uh, utensils uh, made of precious metals. In Egypt, with the fall of uh, Fatimid dynasty in the second half of the 11th century, the tradition of Egyptian glazing fades away. And almost at the same time, as a result of migration of ceramic uh, masters, it is born in Syria, in the area of the city of Raqqa, uh, which at the time was actually the part of Seljuk Persia. So, um, you see, so maybe, you know, it actually really originated from... Uh, Egypt, uh, but was uh, then somehow even before before this uh, migration came, so because we're talking about eleven centuries and we're we're talking about nine, so maybe before that, so you know, some masters came from Egypt and they brought this technique to Iran and why Iran, Iran, and uh, yes, yeah, so debatable. Uh, and overall, just you see the uh, lustreware 
ceramics were considered expensive and had um, most of the time ceremonial significance. The technique of the lustreware is currently well studied. There is even a ancient source where it is described in well, certain details. So it is a treatise, um, the Book of Stones and Incenses. It is written uh, by a master named Abul Kasim. But however you see still, despite this, uh, well, I read, I read, but um, it was a bit different in few sources. So in one source, I read that despite this knowledge, despite that we know how it was made, we know what was going on, the, um, none of the workshop of modern Iran was able to reproduce a copy of the object painted with lusterware. However, in other source, and also, you know, pretty reliable source, um, I, uh, so it was written in the article of, so we have this museum, uh, the museum of uh, Bogdan and Barbara Hanankiv. It is, uh, I already mentioned this in one of the videos, uh, that it actually, uh, right now, a bit, um, so when we had the attack on Kiev and the, the bomb, like, the the missile was uh, hit the missile hit it straight the uh, children's playground and it is directly situated opposite from this museum and you know and we have the road there is not so wide as everywhere else in Kiev so yes yeah, so there is some destruction to this muse museum right now uh, but this is this is a very very important museum in our history and overall it's one of the best museums right now uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and um, so it is divided into two parts. One of them is the Museum of uh, Western Art, because Bodan and Varvara Hanenki, they were collectors, very famous, very um, rich collectors, both were came in from a very, very uh, rich family. So Bodan Hanenko, Hanenki is a rich family, but uh, he, Varvara, his um, wife, she uh, came from um, the family of Tereshchenki, and Tereshchenki is like, it was one of the biggest family, one of the richest uh, family in Ukraine. And uh, and I mean, as, as far as I know, uh, they still have ancestors, but they, they're they like Canadians or Americans, US citizens, I think Canadians. And uh, yeah, so I think I know that, um, well, I mean, I read years ago that uh, one of their ancestors, I think his name is Michael, Michael Tereshchenko. Tereshchenko, <laughs> he is, uh, well, still coming to Ukraine and he's taking part in some cultural things here. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, very important family and they were preserving this art very meticulously. Varvara, she, so uh, the Germans, they proposed to her to uh, take all of this collection of this museum and uh, safely move to Germany. But, well, she was a very smart woman and she clearly understand what they want and she said no i will stay here in my kiev in my house and everything actually then when soviets came and they took this museum and so this woman was actually almost like you know pushed out of her house so she had just a small little room in the attic of her own house of her own house uh, because she said, no, I will stay here. I promise to my husband that I will uh, preserve this collection. I will guard this collection if needed with my life, basically. And this is what happened. And then when she died in uh, 1918, she... Uh, 1989? No, 19, 1980. She's Bogdan died in 1980s, I think. 18. 1918. She dies in 1920s, I think, 2020 something, 1920, uh, whatever. Uh, so she died and she, in her will, wrote that uh, this museum is going to the city of Kiev. No, nowhere else. It stays in Kiev. It isn't. And yeah, and in the period of Second World War, it was kind of also kind of robbed by uh, by Russians, and which was, you know. Uh, I will actually make, I think, it definitely will make a video about this because I have this, I was preparing for university, this how um, uh, how Germans and how uh, Russians were stealing stuff from uh, our museums and still are doing this. 
we still have so many news that they're I mean, still in the art and they have the audacity to stand with all of these paintings and take photos and be like, what the hell? I mean, thank you that you are making our job easier <laughs> in proving that you are stealing stuff, right? And we have, we don't even need to make any researches to put all of these photos into the files to the court. Uh, but... Uh, still uh and uh, and what and why did i start about this oh yes i yes i started about this because the first part is this uh western art the second part is um the oriental art is the eastern art asian art and uh, it is like i think if i'm not mistaken it's like the biggest collection of oriental art of asian art uh, there and uh so uh, so one of the women that is she's like like one of the heads of the museum she wrote uh, in her uh, article that some american master actually uh, in i don't remember what years but eventually not long ago uh, he was able to recreate this technique but i was like huh <laughs> what uh, so so i don't know where is the truth whether it is possible to do this now or not the period of middle ages uh, well which is apparently uh, starting from 8th century if i'm not mistaken there uh the period of flourishing of uh, it was like the period of flourishing of, of ceramics several other cities uh, started to develop and uh well, not develop. What I mean is that uh, several cities started to be, well, we can say, like centers of um, the ceramic world, and especially uh, the there was this city like Ray, like Kashan, Nishapur, so, so, Sultanabad, and etc., etc. But Ray and Kashan occupied a very special place because we can say that it was actually in these two cities there were a real centers of ceramics and there were um, the trendsetters in ceramics. Ceramic workshops, they produced um, the most diverse forms of vessels. Uh, so it was vases, it was jugs, bowls, uh, uh, tiles, as I was mentioned, tiles for everything, for decoration, uh, decorating inside, outside, decorating uh, private places like houses, decorating palaces, decorating mosques, decorating everything that you can imagine. The, the medieval, uh, uh, the medieval Persian ceramics were well, pretty common. It was distributed all over the place, and the main inspiration for them was the gold or silver or gilded plates from the Sassanid uh, dynasty. So it's like 37 AD, but uh, they were just you know, they were like inspired by that, and but they were then you know redoing and um, creating new pieces. In terms of plot, ceramic dishes of the Persian Middle Ages have common features with the plots of uh, metal dishes of Sassanid dynasty. Hence, the common are images of um, wild animals, royal hunts for wild animals, and etc. etc. And ceramic production in uh, in Persian state was also divided, uh, you know, into metropolitan and provincial, individual and royal workshops. So ceramics outside of the king's um, workshop, they were, you know, getting together and they were basically creating uh, such, things, such things as guilds that we had in Europe also. So Iranian ceramics from the period of time of 11th till 14th century, like some like 11th, sometimes someone's writing like 12th century, uh, these uh, like were in, in a full bloom. Vessels and dishes were decorated with lustreware and gold. The patterns were enriched by the weaving of inscriptions. This is the Muslim influ influence. Uh, landscape motifs, uh, genre scenes, uh, images from uh, poetry and folklore, images of rulers on the throne, uh, images of uh, legendary heroes from antiquity, uh, animals, like fantastic animals, like for example, I don't know, like uh, lions with the heads of people, bulls with the heads, uh, bulls with uh, wings, uh, uh, phoenixes, um, and etc. etc. All of this appeared in paintings and decorations of um, ceramics. Depending on the talent of the artist, some of the tableware paintings appear pretty clear at the first place. So uh, you you know you were looking at like oh yes this is this and that, but um, some of the, but others they were designing something you know 
um, they were making these designs that uh, designed for long uh, contemplation for you to look at this vessel vessels a bit longer and to think what are you seeing here most of the characters uh, were created according to a certain scheme and are noticeably generalized so they have large heads closing with ornamentation that hides the body uh, somewhat monotonous postures and movement. So the faces of the characters are rounded, ex expressionless, and also like you know schematic. It is difficult to recognize uh, their mood in terms of their appearance. Also, they all look you know like we can say like siblings because all of them had a same uh, same painted eyes, thin eyebrows, small mouths, and etc. Schematic and generalization is also in inherent in the depiction of animals while preserving a real observation of their behavior. Only a small number of ceramic center reached such a level of development that they turned to a creation of figures dishes in the form of animals. Several centers of medieval Persia reached this level and began to produce some um, ceramic birds and animals, including falcons, um, horses, camels. Among these products, uh, figurines were also found that were uh, devoid of the function of dishes because they had an independent sculptural meaning. A part, as I said, of these vessels, the production of tiles was very important. Also, a pretty ancient practice. Uh, the production of uh, tiles was known since ancient times. However, during the Middle Ages, a tile art was revived and reached its peak at the turn of 12th and 13th century. Uh, tiles had a wide variety of shapes, uh, but we we can say that you know this um, um, octagonal and cross shaped was um, especially popular. Uh, secular buildings or mosques and mausoleums were decorated with uh, tiles with luster ware painting. Uh, tile panels of various shapes covered the lower part of the walls inside the buildings, and the height of the panel was uh, obviously calculated uh, so uh, that a person, you know, that she would come and she would be able to read what is. Um, to read the inscription of the styles on the tile. The panel ended with um, frieze, uh, ornamental, uh, figurative or epigraphic, you know, depending on the on the building where the styles were situated. The massive border tiles of the mihraps are interesting. So mihraps is this uh, niches in uh, niches for praying in the mosque. Uh, so this could be a large relief inscription from the Quran executed and cobbled on the background of a uh, lustreware pattern. Around the end, uh, around the end of 13, beginning of the 14th century, a high relief started to appear also in, on tiles. Um, uh, at the end of 13th century, tiles began to use not only uh, in the inside of the house, or just till this period of time it was just inside, so it was used for walls, for uh, floor, but now it is also used as a decoration uh, for outside of the building. And especially this type of decoration, uh, I mean the decoration of uh, the outside of the building with tiles were, started to be super popular at the period of Safavid dynasty, so it's like 15th century. Mostly it was, you know, these buildings that were decorated with tiles, um, with um, some plant or geometric pattern, uh, secular buildings, they were decorated with tiles depicting scenes of hunting, of uh, everyday life, of some kind of celebrations and what's like etc etc. And what is also uh, important and interesting that uh, now uh, each of the tile, um, you know, they started to be part of the whole composition because beforehand before that uh the um, every tile had its own complete subject uh, but now it is like as we imagine you know one tile had like little piece of the composition and then would be put it together and we would have the whole composition with different tiles another interesting thing that was um, popular and i don't know why it was you know, some kind of surprise for me when I read this because I mean it makes actually a very like great sense but I was kind of surprised that a very popular like during the Safavid also period the cobalt painting was uh, very popular. Uh, this technique has been known for several centuries but now it, um, it has become 
uh, especially developed due to the influence of Chinese porcelain. So I think all of you, uh, this is also like one of the first um, association with China, this uh, blue and white porcelain. And uh, so Iranians have the same thing. Uh, however, Iranians, you know, they started to imitate this uh, Chinese product and many Iranian works of this period are made in the Chinese spirit. They were even sent to Europe together with porcelain, porcelain from, from China. And in the middle of the 17th century, uh, Chinese export actually declined sharply. And for quite a while, Iranian production was number one on the European market, which was also a pretty surprising thing because, um, because, yes. We didn't learn that. I, I didn't didn't know that. <laughs> Although you see, Iranian masters were inspired by Chinese works. They did not blindly just copy them, but preceded them through the prism of local tradition and Iranian identity also. Uh, another interest, interesting thing is the kubachi ceramics, named after the place uh, of its uh, where it was discovered in Dagestan. Uh, it was the village of Kubachi. So the like, Dagestan is modern, uh, modern part of Russia, and uh, it is pretty interesting. As I said, cobalt products can be compared with Chinese prototypes only in some of the uh, some of the pattern. And this uh, this um, pottery, uh, this ceramics works uh, is distinguished by a rather sloppy picturesque um, bring painting on a white background with a brown. Uh, cracular grid. And you can also find paintings in the black under a turquoise glaze and polychrome carving uh, using colored uh, engobes. So engobes, I don't know to be honest um, what... So I mean it's a French word but I have no idea how to translate it in English because uh, when I was translating it, I was trying to find it in English uh, like in Wikipedia for example it's like you know, the best way to just using the translations of different, you using just you know, the same article just in a different language, and it was bringing me to the page that was like completely different thing. So it was you know calling because and gobs is like not type of pottery as it's written, and gobs it's actually the painting based on liquid clay uh, and uh, neutral colors, or sometimes it was pigmented uh, uh, with different colors. So it is kind of painting, not a type of pottery. So I have no idea how to translate it uh, for it to be accurate in English. That was, you know, like last centuries, like 16th, 17th, where stuff for pottery was going on pretty well. And the economic decline uh, that occurred at the end of the 17th century naturally had a very negative impact on the pottery production and ceramics has largely lost its symbolic meaning. Traditional forms of vessels have disappeared. Their production was preserved only in hard to reach uh, mountain villages and there at the beginning of 20th century ceramic objects of ancient forms and decoration were used, which is undoubtedly connected with the preservation of a number of ancient rituals and also beliefs. However, you know, it's like a mountain part, so it's a bit also, I think, different talk, so we uh, yes, so stuff like that. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, then, many workshops just completely closed, so things started to get even harder. And and the industry experienced its revival only uh, on the, uh, the only in the 19th century. So yeah, so things like that. Uh, so it is like, as I said, it is a very, very brief, um, just history overall of Iran, of everything like that, of uh, ceramics, because it's a very, very, very large theme, very large topic. So uh, as I said, check out the description if you're interested. There will be a lot of interesting books and a video there. Uh, and I'm pretty sure just overall you can find other things here on YouTube about that. But uh, yeah, this is everything that I have for today. And uh, yeah, let's stay strong, let's fight and uh, um, get rid of <laughs> all of the, um, of all of this old, uh, completely detached of this world uh, men. And uh, yeah, stay strong. And usually 
what is the most important that you found something new for yourself today because i certainly did and as i said that was a topic that i was not familiar with and i was also blown away about this topic and about what was going on there and uh, yeah wish you all of the best uh, good morning good evening good have a good day <laughs> and uh, hope to see you in the next videos bye bye